I got a master's degree as a teacher of the visually impaired and a certification as an orientation and mobility instructor. Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Blind Abilities presents Keith Ford. Back in the old days, it was just kids that were just partially sighted and totally blind. But over time, I had to learn to adapt my instruction to meet the needs of lots of different children and actually learn new skills. A retired teacher for the blind and visually impaired and orientation and mobility instructor. I use the Perkins Braille Writer for math because uh, you could have lines, you know, horizontally, vertically, or well, in the Braille display, it's just a flat and horizontal surface. And you can't do the spatial element of Braille, which is uh, missing, but on the paper, you get that. This podcast was made possible by our teen correspondent, Simon Bonifant. This device that's being developed at the University of Michigan, it'll be like a Braille iPad, which will just be like a sheet of Braille, the way it'll produce lines Mm -hmm. and they can do graphs. And for more podcasts with the blindness perspective, be sure to check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, and download the free Blind Abilities app from the App Store and Google Play Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. I'm real pragmatic. I would, I would always tell students that they want to get into something that's going to lead to employment after college. And now, here's Simon Bonifant with Keith Ford. Well, you certainly want to have dual certification as an O&M instructor and a teacher of the visually impaired. That's really important to have that flexibility. Hello, Blind Abilities. This is Simon Bonifant here, and I'm here at the state convention in Pennsylvania of the National Federation of the Blind, and I got a chance to talk to a man named Keith Ford. How you doing, Keith? Hello. Very nice to talk to you. Okay. And Keith, you are a retired mobility instructor, is that uh, correct? And a teacher of the visually impaired. Oh, very nice. And it's very interesting because as I was talking to Keith, I found out that he's not blind and he's sighted. So we were talking about uh, how that worked. And how did you get into the field of orientation and mobility and, and teacher to visually impaired? Well, that was way back in 1985 where I was decided to make a career change. And I thought something that a helping profession would be more something I was interested in pursuing. And I guess it has to do with attitudes and interests and abilities and just a certain view of life. Maybe you just feel more comfortable working in a helping profession than something else. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Did you get a degree to do this kind of job? Yes, I went to the University of Pittsburgh and I got a master's degree as a teacher of the visually impaired and it also had certification as an orientation and mobility instructor. But I graduated in August of 1986. Well, wow, very nice. So did you do orientation and mobility and TVI all in the same kind of job? As like an itinerant certain- teacher, yes. Okay. As you were working in this field, what did it teach you? What did you learn the most from your students as you were teaching them? In the time that I taught, you saw a lot of change occurring, where in the early years, most of my students were just partially sighted or totally blind. But then as time went on, you saw more multi-impaired children. We like to use in the profession terms like life skills and learning support. So you had more and more students like that. And then you saw more and more autistic children who are visually impaired. And then more and more students that are called cortically visually impaired, where that deals with trauma to the brain since you have more and more premature babies being born. So CVI, cortical visual impairment, usually involves a long list of visual behaviors Mm -hmm. because it's trauma to the brain. It's not to the eye or the optic nerve. So that's a whole different ball game. And it's, it's still a relatively new aspect to what teaches the visually impaired do. Right. But they're predicting that CVI students will be the new face of blindness wow. in original impairment in the future. It's always been, to answer your question, over the time I taught, there was just so much change. Back in the old days, it was just kids that were just partially sighted and totally blind. But over time, I had to learn to adapt my instruction to meet the needs of lots of different children and actually learn new skills. Nowadays, in orientation and mobility programs, you're getting a lot more emphasis on students that are totally blind and totally deaf. So there's right. instruction involving those kinds of students, which wasn't a part of my instruction back in 1985. But the field is always changing because the population is just changing. Nowadays, kids that are just partially sighted or totally blind, they're in the minority. Right. You're also seeing a lot 
of new approaches to orientation and mobility. Back in the old days, we were always taught that you had to have a control mechanism to cross an intersection like a stop sign or a traffic light. Right. But now more and more travelers are encountering situations where there isn't a control mechanism. So right. there's this emphasis on crossing at intersections where there isn't any control mechanism. There's a decision-making process involved in that called acceptable risk and non-acceptable risk. And okay, it's still yeah. a relatively new thing, but it's blind and partially sighted travelers are, are running into situations now where they have to cross, where there isn't a control mechanism. Not that every crossing can ever, you know, there's some crossings you just can't make. They just can't be done. Right. You shouldn't try. But the, the whole idea of acceptable risk and unacceptable risk is something you have to learn. There are decision-making skills you have to learn for that, and it's something that's happening more and more, making those kinds of crossings. Overall, I would say what I've learned from my students is just learning new skills to work with students that have other handicapping conditions. So that would probably be the most I've received from my students is I had to learn to adapt and learn new skills. And did you have to learn Braille when you were becoming a TVI? Oh, yes. We had a heavy emphasis on Braille back in the old days, certainly. Braille is very important, but there are some students that are lower functioning that just can't understand Braille. Right. So they can't use it. Right. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes in your time in the blindness field in terms of technology. Like, oh, yes. Were you using the Perkins Braille Writers back when you started? It's always going to be there, the Perkins Braille Writer, because technology breaks down. Exactly. But, yeah. but, but the assistive technology they have nowadays is a much higher quality, much more reliable. Back when I started, we had the Versa Braille P2C, which in its day was a wonderful thing, but they had a lot of breakdowns. And by the end of the school year, you'd have to send the Versa Braille P2C back to the manufacturer manufacturer and they'd have to kind of do an overhaul, just replace things or just upgrade it to get it back to where it's totally functional for September. But yeah. as time went on, you'd have little glitches here and there, but the quality of the equipment they have now for visually impaired students is a whole lot better. Yeah. Plus you're seeing, like they say the iPhone, you have the uh, accessibility options are built into the uh, technology. So it's technology that is used by sighted people, but also can be used by blind and partially sighted. So that brings the cost down, sir. You're also seeing, uh, which I'm, I'm a kind of excited about, up at the University of Michigan, they're trying to build, they're developing this, it's, it's like an iPad that will have refreshable Braille that will be less expensive. I've heard they're using, whether it's compressed air or some kind of gel technology and to reproduce Braille cells on an iPad-like device with lines of Braille rather than the refreshable Braille units that are electronic and cost a lot more money. Yeah, I know Braille is very important. But to getting the cost down is really important. There's probably always going to be a need for paper Braille, but I think as time goes on, the paper less Braille is going to be more the case. Bring down the cost? It'll be more more common. Okay, yeah. And being able to carry Braille in a small device like you have with you now certainly makes a lot more sense than those bulky Braille books. Yes. But we're always going to have paper Braille and Perkins Braillers because things break down and yeah. you want to have a hard copy. But in their day, the, I think the Perkins Brailler came out in the late 1950s. That was a really big yep. deal when it came yep. out. Oh, and I know I still use the Perkins Braille Writer. When I transitioned to the Braille Net, I used to think, I don't know if I'll ever use the Perkins Braille Writer, but then I found a use for it, and I'm like, you know, technology breaks down, stuff happens. Uh, with the Perkins Braille Writer, you don't need a battery, you know? It, it works. Uh, sometimes the best low-tech solutions are the most high-tech to get things done. You know? Yeah, so. yeah. I have a Perkins Braille at home I used when I was working, and it's, you know, very reliable, very well-made piece of equipment, mm -hmm. and you always have to respect it. It'll always be there. A hundred years from now, it'll be still being used but oh, yeah. it's exciting to see all the neat technology because it allows for blind and partially sighted people to have greater access to the world and getting employment and right along with sighted people it is a positive thing in the long run oh yeah now have you heard of the ira application I've heard uh, about that. I about believe that. it's a device that you wear and then a sighted person at another location tells you what to look for or Yes, it connects you with a sighted agent and it can it can help in any kind of activity of and it also helps in the mobility mm -hmm. aspect, you know, that that's come a long way too because uh, you know, there's certain things that are not gonna be visible with the cane, you know, like street signs or numbers on a, on, on doors and things. That's something that IRA will help out with. So the technology has come a long way with mobility and, and braille and 
And now we have even things that'll take print and read it out loud or, or take print and put it in a braille material. So braille is, it's getting to be more available now these days. Oh so. yeah. When I used to teach children braille, children that were included within a regular ed environment, I used to work with the classroom teacher and we would teach the sighted children about braille too. We'd have braille cells all over the place and numbers and on a child's desk in kindergarten, we'd have print, the name of the child in print and in braille so that they could learn in class or get some experience with, with what their blind peer in the class was learning. So it made it really nice. The kids enjoyed that and it helped the blind child to feel very much a part of the class. When I was working, when I was teaching young blind children braille readiness skills, I used to do a lot of stuff like that, creative things yeah. to just make everybody aware of braille yeah. and they just thought that was neat, you know. Have you also used tactile diagrams? Well, yeah, How do you utilize that? tactile graphics. I've used software that would produce tactile graphics for different things. Mm -hmm. And plus, Patton, they would provide they do that, you know. textbooks that had tactile graphics il illustrations inside with thermoform. They're a wonderful service that is still used today. Absolutely. And I think that's the one thing that's reading Braille in the electronic display, that's great. But I think Braille paper is always going to be needed because uh, tactile diagrams and stuff that can't come up on a flat display. I, I use the Perkins Braille writer for math because uh, you could have lines, you know, horizontally, vertically. Well, in the Braille display, it's just a flat horizontal surface. And you can't do the spatial element of Braille, which is missing, but on the paper, you get that. Well, see, with, with this device that's being developed at the University of Michigan, it'll be like a Braille iPad, which will just be like a sheet of Braille, the way it'll produce lines, mm -hmm. and they can do graphs on the, from what I'm being told, they'll be able to produce graphs and all kinds of tactile graphics that's on great. this new device. That's um, great. Yeah. So, so Keith, my final question is, what would be your advice to blind students who are in high school or either transitioning to college or to the workplace? And also, what would be your advice to people, instructors who are thinking about going in this field? Well, I would say, I mean, I'm real pragmatic. I would, I would always tell students that they want to get into something that's going to lead to employment after college. So any kind of technology field would be beneficial. I would also say that you want to do some vocation interest training or testing like at Penn State here we have the CEDAR program and you can do some vocational interest testing with them it's always good to gather data about yourself whatever you've achieved in life whatever area you've shown any kind of aptitude and interest and you want to get into a field where there's a need for your services any kind of technology related kind of degree is always going to give you a better chance. And you, were, you were talking about your other part of your question about instructors or people getting into the field. Yes. Well, you certainly want to have dual certification as an O&M instructor and a teacher of the visually impaired. That's really important to have that flexibility. You just don't want to have just one. Right, because you can get work in both and there's a high demand for that. Yeah. The field is always changing. You want to get acquainted with this whole new system of cortical visual impairment. There's a whole new evaluation tool to get acquainted with that so that you can evaluate those kinds of students. You certainly want to gain as much and the programs I'm hearing about nowadays are putting much more emphasis on multi-impaired students, deaf-blind students, which wasn't the case when I was getting my university training because it was just a different time. I would also mention the importance of just getting as much information and training and experience in dealing with just a wide range of visually impaired students. Oh yeah, well, very nice. And uh, Keith, I want to thank you for coming on the program today, the podcast. Okay. And thank you for sharing your insights with all of us. And have it going. Okay. Once again, a big thank you goes out to our team correspondent, Simon Bonifant, and to Keith Ford for sharing with us his experiences as a BTBI and O&M instructor. And a huge thank you to Chi Chow for his beautiful music. That's L Chi Chow on Twitter. Once again, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed. And until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through each other's, each other's eyes, eyes, we can then, we can then begin, begin to bridge the, the gap between the limited, limited expectations, expectations and the reality of, of reality of blind abilities. Realities of blind abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. On Twitter at BlindAbilities. Download our app from the App Store, BlindAbilities, that's two words. Or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.